Welcome to the 2023 Atlas Venture Year in Review. My name is Bruce Booth. I'm one of the partners at Atlas Venture. And over the next 45 to 50 minutes, we're going to dive into three things. One, biopharma innovation and some of the risks that it faces. A deep dive into the capital markets and the venture ecosystem. And a quick update on Atlas Venture. And so let's dive in. In terms of biopharma innovation, the really biggest theme of the last year or two has been about putting the big back into big pharma, whether that's obesity and metabolic disease or Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, two massive market opportunities with significant unmet needs that are now being addressed. On the obesity side of things, all of us are familiar with the compelling GLP-1 data in weight loss. So you can see as you get increasing mechanistic involvement, we have multiple agents driving greater and greater weight loss. But this isn't just about losing weight. This is also about major clinical outcomes. If we look at the recent cardiovascular outcomes trial, 20% reduction in stroke, heart attack, or death. Massive medical benefit. We've also seen improved heart failure symptoms from the step hefpef heart failure trial. More recently in kidney, also seeing functional improvements. So really profound medical advances against a number of significant diseases. All of this conspiring to make this probably the largest drug class in history. Over $80 billion forecast here by the end of the decade. You may ask yourself that perhaps this is going to break the bank of the healthcare system. The reality is obesity is a major driver of healthcare costs. $170 billion in excess healthcare spend just in the United States alone. Obese individuals adding 2,000 in incremental excess healthcare costs each year. If we look at the major drivers of healthcare cost, this graph here on the left captures it, systemic blood pressure, BMI, and waist circumference. If we could address those three things, we could have a profound overall impact on healthcare system costs. All of this excitement around obesity has led to a burgeoning pipeline in the obesity space. Here's a select group of phase two and beyond programs, Novo and Lilly leading the way, Pfizer, Amgen, and others, of course, developing their own. But beyond just the GLP-1 and the Incretin class, we're seeing emerging MOAs, like the ACT-R2A and B program, Lilly just acquired from Versanis, GPR-75, Inhibin e a number of really exciting genetic targets in obesity. So that's the obesity space. If we turn to the neuroscience side of things, after a false start with Aduhelm and a couple decades of failure in the beta amyloid space, we now have two antibodies with significant overall improvements in the Alzheimer's setting. We're seeing 35% slowing of cognitive decline, 80% plaque clearance, a good portion of patients really showing delayed disease progression. And so while these advances may seem modest, the medical opportunity and the enormous unmet need of Alzheimer's makes these very exciting breakthroughs for patients. Of course, this is forecast to be a $10 billion class of drugs here by the end of the decade. Despite what may be, seem like a slow start to Lequembe's sales, it looks like it will be a significant overall product opportunity. Of course, these advances in neuroscience are supported by lots of renewed excitement about the space. We're seeing programs against hot and exciting targets like TREM2, GBA, Progranulin, LARC2, and many others. At least three other major drivers here in the neuroscience space continue to make it a quite exciting place to be advancing new medicines. The first is the use of surrogate endpoints like neurofilament light chain for the approval of recent ALS drug. These sort of fluid biomarkers establish a very compelling regulatory path for agents that are addressing things like neuronal loss. Blood-brain barrier delivery. Recent data shows you can get oligos into the brain for SI knockdown of particular targets. And we've also seen some exciting new data from shuttle technology delivering larger proteins across the blood-brain barrier. And then lastly, on the imaging side of things, increasing use of both MRI and PET imaging, not only for monitoring PD effects, but also for tracking the course of disease. And so quite an exciting overall landscape in both neurosciences and in the obesity and metabolic space have really captured the, the hearts of the overall um, equity markets. Lilly and Novo alone, the former being a player in both, Novo primarily in the obesity space, 
have added half a trillion dollars of market cap over the last two years. Lilly is about a 10x, Novo an 8x over the last 10 years, delivering venture-like returns from large pharma companies. Of course, not all big areas have been in favor. The COVID names um, have been hit particularly hard, Pfizer and Moderna collectively losing over $200 billion during that same two-year period. A big part of this, of course, being that the pandemic drug windfall and vaccine windfall is over. Peaking out at $75 billion, most forecasts are for that to drop by 65 to 80 percent through the course of the decade, despite a five-fold increase in price, suggesting that volumes are off 95-plus percent. Big driver of that is, unfortunately, vaccine hesitation. There's questions about uh, prolonged durability, and importantly, some risk-benefit questions linger, especially in different demographic populations. So if we step back then and think about the overall innovation and market heat map, you have obesity and Alzheimer's, exciting areas in the market today, COVID perhaps less exciting, you can put all the other major areas onto this map. I'm not going to speak to every one of them, but let me start with a deep dive in I. &I. The decade of immunology was teed up back in a 2016 year in review, and we are definitely in it, the immune system playing a role in so many, so many diseases. But in particular, we've seen an acceleration within you know, the direct area of autoimmune disease. Here are seven really exciting cytokine and related targets and signaling pathway targets in the autoimmune space. A number of these are well precedent and validated, some with approved drugs, some with emerging modalities, such as oral, orally active agents, whether it's TIC2, with the uh, approval of SOTIC2, and certainly the excitement of uh, the Nimbus and Takeda deal, but a number of other plays, interleukins, signaling pathways, and the like. So lots of excitement here, both in terms of investor interest, patient uh, benefit, and of course, M&A and partnering activity. A lot of other mechanisms are coming up behind these, IRAC4, STAT6 and STAT3, MK2, the salt-inducible kinases. Lots of excitement in the space. To help quantify it, there are over 300 drugs in development for autoimmune disease, hitting 165 targets and 75 different disease indications. So an enormous amount of overall activity uh, in the autoimmune inflammatory space. But this space is really dwarfed by oncology. Oncology remains 40% of the overall industry's pipeline, but oncology is an area where there's been caution flags thrown. There are some concerns and some real challenges in the oncology space. The first of which is that really big transformative breakthroughs are not only incredibly rare, but when they do show up, they tend to dominate. If you look at the about 160 solid tumor drug approvals over the last uh, six years or so, Almost half of them came from PD-1s, and half of those came just from Keytruda. If you look at the level of benefit of most drugs, 70% of cancer drugs only have low or inter intermediate value to patients and impact on patients. So it's very hard to get significant clinical outcomes in these settings, and when you do, it tends to concentrate around a very small number of drugs and mechanisms. The second major challenge has been crowding, a theme many of us um, have heard of, uh, heard a lot about over the last couple years. That gold line is particularly staggering. That's number of uh, assets per target in, in the oncology space. You can see today we're over a dozen, on average, assets per target. A huge crowding on mechanisms in the oncology space. Some household names at the very top of that list include CD19, PD1, HER2, BCMA, and the like. These have scores of programs in clinical development uh, and, approved, and approved on the market. As we just saw, PD1 had its ninth approval in the United States. Over a thousand clinical trials started each of the last three years using PD1 agents. So an enormous amount of crowding and activity here in these spaces. But it's not just crowding on drug targets that work. We also have crowding around targets that don't work. And so the IGF-1R case study in cancer uh, came out this summer. 16 drugs have been taken into the clinic, over 180 clinical trials, 12,000 patients, billions spent, and yet in cancer, no approvable data up to this point. 
and a good example of perhaps wasteful spending due to crowded areas and excitement around less validated targets. The third area of concern in oncology is that 50% of the ongoing several thousand clinical trials in the space are really for very rare uh, small oncology indications, often dominated by precision stratification based on genetics. And so these are well outside of the big five, breast, prostate, lung, colon, and melanoma. But as you go down into a few thousand patients in different types of leukemia and lymphoma, and then different genetic stratifications of those, you may only have 500, 1,000, 2,000 patients in some of these particular clinical trial settings. The challenge is really twofold in this area. One, just recruiting those patients, finding, identifying, screening, and getting them enrolled in your clinical trial when there's an enormous amount of competition is very challenging. Right now in ALL, there are more clinical spots per incidence of disease than any other cancer indication, and there's only a few thousand patients with that disease. The second big challenge of this is once you get a drug approved, if you're a larger company building a commercially sustainable long-term franchise based on such tiny market opportunities is incredibly challenging. So those are some of the reasons that oncology may have a caution flag, but there are some bright spots in the oncology landscape in particular, the antibody drug conjugate space, as we recently saw, Merck just did a $4 billion deal with Daiichi. We saw standing ovation level data in the ADC space at ESMO. Real excitement about that as a modality coming into uh, fruition here. Its sister, Radio Farm, also an exciting area and lots of emerging data. These other areas are also ones that are fairly exciting in the oncology landscape. Another area I'd like to touch on is gene therapy. Here, gene therapies have the potential for massive patient impact. I keep coming back in my head to the uh, Zolgensma SMA um, patient, the young girl who was given the medicine and was able to walk and move and live a more functional life. This is the promise and potential of gene therapy. We have a number of gene therapies that have been approved recently, but unfortunately, the markets are largely indifferent to many of these massive contraction in the overall landscape in the gene therapy space, a, a real, real challenge. Sarepta's recent drop just being one of those examples. Of course, a couple bright spots, Crystal being one of those, having gotten a, a recent uh, gene therapy approved for a horrific skin disorder. Um, so there are some bright spots, but overall, a real disconnect between clinical impact and value for patients and what the, uh, what the market and streets view of the space is. So if we come back to the overall innovation heat map, one of the themes that seems clear to me is this move from rare and precision and very small disease opportunities back towards the really big, broad patient opportunity. In many ways, this is just double-clicking on what is the fundamental business model of Big Pharma, um, the blockbuster model. And it remains a major force. So if you look at the 170 or so drugs that have been launched by top pharma companies over the last 10 years, one out of five has reached that billion-dollar threshold that uh, characteristically defines a blockbuster drug. But the concentration of cumulative revenues in that group is massive. Uh, $500 billion of cumulative uh, industry revenues just from that blockbuster group. And then if you apply R&D costs to these, the bottom half, the bottom 60%, is likely R&D negative, ROI negative for most large pharma companies. To put a finer point on how this power law, this very much um, Pareto distribution of, of value and returns come from, just the top seven drugs in the last decade, 4% of all the approvals, drove over $200 billion, or 28%, of industry revenues. Two of them, of course, being PD-1 programs, Keytruda and Opdivo. So massive concentration around the drugs and drug classes that work. Where do these drugs come from? Well, that's a good uh, segue into FDA approvals. And so if we look overall this year, we're going to be on track with the sort of running eight to 10 year industry average of 50 or 60 new drug approvals, lots of great exciting medicines, oral small molecules, biologics, ADC, cell therapies, really a broad range of great and exciting new medicines that I think we as industry participants can be really proud of in terms of broad patient impact. 
But if we look a layer deeper and back onto this theme of big versus small indications, it's interesting to note that 55% of these approvals um, in the last year or two have been for very rare or small disease opportunities. And about two thirds of the opportunities are not being sponsored or launched by the largest 20 pharmaceutical companies. And so a subset of that group is the emerging biotech group. That emerging biotech group has more and more confidence in launching drugs. Historically, when a mid-cap biotech company launched a drug, the theme was to short the launch. Within three and 12 months after launch, most stocks trade down in the biotech space, or at least they did. In 22 and 23, it looks like that has changed. Companies that are launching drugs seem better able to set expectations, are enabled with better execution, and have actually been trading up in this current environment. One of the big drivers of that, of course, being the expectation of post-approval M&A, most recently being Marathi on this list of a few of the companies that got bought after they successfully were able to launch new medicines. So that's what's happening in the emerging mid-cap biotech uh, new drug space. Let's um, step back towards the big pharma component. So a third to 40% or so of all the new drugs that have been approved the last five years have been from top 20, sponsored by top 20 pharmaceutical companies. Where do these drugs come from? Only a quarter of them actually come from in-house R&D organizations. That means the vast majority are sourced externally. And of those, nearly two-thirds are from uh, M&A events, the other third or so from in-licensing, highlighting the importance of both M&A and, more broadly, external innovation as a way to drive value in our ecosystem. Every year, we step back as a, as a firm and think about what are the hottest new drugs in the industry's pipeline? Well, this year, these were the six. And um, it's not a coincidence, I guess, that half of these were externally sourced. So Merck, with the oral PCSK9 program, was part of a partnership with Raw Pharmaceuticals. J&J partnered with Protagonist for its oral IL-23, and BridgeBio with IDOS, an academic spin-out, to get its TTR stabilizer. Three in-house, homegrown programs that are exciting in the industry today, of course, Amgen's 133 program, the, the exciting uh, mid-stage obesity program, and then 548 against the genetically well-validated NAV 1.8 uh, target. We uh, anxiously await the data from its upcoming uh, clinical releases. And then Marathi with its PRMT5 inhibitor, some early exciting data in solid tumors. So these represent six of what are scores of really interesting drugs in the latter part of the industry's pipeline. Atlas II has a number of exciting clinical stage assets. And I'll just mention a few here. Intellia in HAE with the gene editing program. Dyne with DM1, anticipating data here in the next few months. Chimera with its IRAC4 degrader, partnered with Sanofi, has just dosed its first uh, phase two patients. And then three that were externally sourced. Akira's FGF21 in F2F3 pre serotic NASH. Um, Bitapertin in uh, what is a very rare phototoxicity. And then most recently, Ilos with our T-slip uh, program for asthma, a brand new company that has been formed around this. Those latter three externally sourced from other industry partners, showing that external innovation really flows in both directions. If we roll all this up and step back to the whole industry, how big is the industry pipeline? Well, it's incrementally larger this year, a few percentage points, now 6,000 programs in clinical development or under regulatory review, about 40% of which is in oncology. Thousands of clinical trials, um, two thirds of them are in phase one or phase two. These are new clinical trial starts this year. So a lot of clinical activity. I think it's important to recognize that clinical activity of this scale requires massive engagement from patient communities. Nearly two million patients participated in these clinical trials uh, last year. And so partnership with the patient communities and an appreciation for the risks that they're taking to help us advance these investigational therapies is super important. Another aspect to this growing industry pipeline is modality diversification. And so here's a snapshot of both preclinical and clinical, as well as marketed forms of sort of novel overall, uh, overall modalities beyond small molecules and, and classic uh, biologics. You have cell therapies, ADCs, stem cells, 
oncolytic viruses, Protex, and the like. What's interesting to note is only a few of these have actually added real, um, real value to, uh, to pipelines and commercial products. ADCs, mRNA, of course, on the vaccine front being two of the most profound. But we're all excited, I think, to see that white line move up across a broad range of these novel and impactful modalities. Now, pharma and biotech have invested up and down this continuum. And in fact, this has been an area of lots of deal activity in the past year or so. Here's a snapshot from some BioCentury data showing the number of product deals and research collaborations really stretching throughout this modality space. Of course, anchored by small molecules that includes things like next-gen Protax, molecular glues, and the like, but a broad range of other modalities. Pharma is generally approaching these biotech collaborations as a way to get to first-in-class novel therapy. So 75% of these deals fit that overall profile. Great thing about novel therapies is they have the potential to have massive patient impact, but they also take on significantly more risk. And that's a great segue to talk about risk and the three factors that drive R&D productivity, really the triad of productivity being risk, time, and cost. And so if we look at risk, seeing some recent IQVIA data, a real drop in phase one success rates, a drop in phase three, a drop in regulatory, combining to create an aggregate success rate that is well below the 10-year running average in every disease area except for vaccines. And so a really significant um, challenge on uh, survival rates in those areas. What's caused this? One of them, I believe, certainly in phase one, may be novel modalities, more diverse modalities that we're just learning how to turn into medicines. And then in the later stages, of course, regulatory goalpost changing and the potential for late stage idiosyncratic blowups. Every year we highlight uh, some of these high profile failures as a way to celebrate that failures are indeed a part of our business. Most recently, Sage and Intercept faced some FDA challenges. Fibrogen, Roche, Accelerin on the data side, really seeing less than exciting efficacy data. Apellus with its safety challenges last summer. EQRX with you know, fundamentally uh, a challenge to its entire business model not being able to get executed in the current environment. And then lastly, I'd call attention to Benevolent, one of the leading AI machine learning companies, killing its lead program. Even AI and machine learning can't help you escape the challenges of clinical trial attrition that faces so many companies. So that's the risk side of the productivity equation. If we look on the time side, timelines haven't gotten any shorter across the industry. You know, nine to 10 years to bring a drug through early development through to registration that hasn't fundamentally changed in the last decade or so. And then on the cost side of the equation, this looks at the top 12 pharmaceutical companies, total amount spent per MNA, uh, new medical entity, roughly in that four and a half to five billion mark. So just massive amounts of money to bring big drugs uh, to market. Boiling this all up, of course, on the R&D productivity side, you have elevated risk, time and cost largely going sideways. But I'd say overall that paints a challenging R&D productivity equation for the industry right now. But science risk and some of these embedded science risks aren't the only risk that our industry faces. There's at least five risks coming out of Washington, D.C., the drug pricing, FTC, patent landscape, regulatory aspects, and then, of course, interest rates. On the drug pricing side, look, we got the hit list of the 10 drugs that uh, um, the pricing fix is now in on. These um, companies are thankfully participating in the um, IRA, and they're about ready to get given an offer that they can't refuse uh, by the government. Now, Holding aside the aspects of government negotiation on price, there are two other things about this law that um, I think are fundamentally challenging to the industry. One is, and frankly to patients, one is that oral convenient drugs are discouraged relative to complex biologics. That, of course, seems very counterintuitive. And then secondly, the, the way in which the time clock starts before you have government set pricing really changes the model of having a sentinel indication and building out from there which suggests that drugs will be delayed in how they reach patients as folks try to do more and more work before actually seeking approval. 
So real challenges. There's whispers in Washington that these latter two things will be resolved, um, but I'm certainly not going to hold my breath. This may not uh, all come to pass. Who knows? There, there are a set of um, real lawsuit challenges to implement in the IRA, both by large pharma companies and by trade groups. Um, the, the various uh, claims are that these violate the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment, the excessive fines of the Eighth, and the compelled speech of the First to say that they are actively participating and supporting um, what is going on. These will all resolve here in the next three to six months and will be interesting to see how they play through. On the FTC side of things, it looks like M&A is avoiding getting consulted. Lina Khan and her colleagues at the FTC were not successful in blocking the Horizon acquisition by Amgen, and so that has, uh, has proceeded. We're anxiously awaiting the Seattle Genetics acquisition by Pfizer to close. Fundamentally, though, the FTC risk around all this creates hesitation. It creates friction and uncertainty in the deal process and is very much a part of all of the active deal dialogues that we have. Which pharma partner has a lower FTC risk is something that's actively being discussed in biotech boardrooms for the first time. Remains to be seen what the impact on you know, actual deals and rejection of actual deals will be, but certainly uncertainty is not welcome in the deal process. The third big issue is around patents. This spring we had Amgen and Sanofi in front of the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court narrowed and invalidated the concept of really broad field-blocking patents, like to entire epitopes and such, unless you had complete enablement, which is really impractical. What this means, though, is that prophetic platform IP, in particular for a young biotech company, may be significantly narrowed with this precedent over time, making uh, the possibility of more Me Too's not only on products, but importantly, more Me Too's on technology going forward. So this is definitely an area to watch. The fourth uh, risk is around the FDA. I think there's a sentiment that the FDA is getting tougher. If we look at clinical holds and partial clinical holds on the left, this year's run rate is going to be in line with where things have been for much of the last 10 years. Coming off of a peak in 2021, of uh, nearly 60 clinical holds. And so on the hold side, that might be more of the same, but on the FDA rejections as a share of novel drug actions, that has gone up to 31%. The fourth risk is around regulatory. And so the FDA is perceived to have gotten tougher. We look at the clinical holds here on the left, partial clinical holds and clinical holds as overall, really at the run rate of the last 10 years or so. So the FDA is maintaining a high bar for this coming off of really quite a high peak in 2021. But probably more troubling is the share of novel actions, uh, uh, the share of actions against novel agents. Now almost 30 plus percent are uh, complete response letters or rejections by the FDA. And so that's certainly a big uptick from where we were just a handful of years ago. And then the FDA is doing this in a much more insular manner. Used to be that you'd have 50 or so advisory committees a year. It's at the FDA bringing in experts from all, all sorts of different fields. That's dropped by over 60% in recent years. So convening less expert outside um, input as they're making their drug decisions. And so I think a particularly challenging environment here for the FDA. And then lastly, on interest rates, we all know the Fed has gone through what is uh, at least historically almost unprecedented aggressive rate increases here over the last period of time. That has really sucked the wind out of all risk capital. Certainly any long duration asset like biotech, where you have to discount back uh, far in the future cash flows, higher interest rates um, have, have had a significant contraction around capital markets activity. And this idea of higher for longer has certainly scared investors in the last uh, couple months or so, uh, for sure. Great news that the Fed recently held rates, but I think all of this has conspired to make for a more challenging capital market from a macro perspective. And that's actually a great segue to the venture part of the uh, capital market and the venture ecosystem here. So let's start with a little context. Here are two great quotes about the recent period of time that we've been in where during the bubble, we had gravity suspended, and now we have discriminating uh, capital allocation coming back into to place. It used to be all about big platform technologies and preclinical assets, and is now even clinical assets are fighting for attention from the investment community. Of course, what's great about these quotes 
is there from 20 years ago from the late Fred Frank and uh, the late Frank Baldino in what was the Ernst & Young 2003 biotech report titled Resilience. If you don't, didn't read these reports, they were sort of the annual Bible of all things data in the biotech space. Um, really a fascinating read, in part because almost all of the themes in the 2003 report uh, could be echoed here for today. Taking a look at the stock market, it took the biotech markets after the genomics bubble nearly three years before it truly settled out and started uh, to tick back up. We're almost three years in to the um, post-pandemic bubble at this point. But those common themes are all there. A collapse in venture funding, window closing for IPOs, platforms out, products in, restructurings, lots of uh, consolidation in the space, and a well-accepted view that a bubblish is hindsight, that we're recovering from um, irrational exuberance, and certainly drug pricing uh, issues were, were prevalent then as well. So Im amazing in some ways that the, uh, um, you know, the similarities between the 2003 timeframe and where we are here 20 years later. If we take a look just at the last five years though, markets peaked out in, in February of 2021 proceeded to decline until June of 22, and then have largely tread water for much of the following year, year and a half or so, up until uh, the last handful of weeks when we saw the markets, uh, the bottom come out of some of the markets here due to these macro concerns. But if we look at that first downdraft from the peak until June of 22, I showed this slide last year, but it was really a tight correlation between biotech and all of the various tech sectors including social media, the internet, uh, the non-profitable tech index, we were all moving together because it was primarily about uh, the macro environment, the expectation of rising interest rates and the like. But in the last uh, you know, year to date here in 2023, we've seen a massive decoupling. So biotech has massively underperformed most of the tech sectors. So the tech heavy S&P, but also the NASDAQ, even if you look at the non-profitable tech index, so these are all smaller tech companies, significantly outperforming biotech by 25 or 30 percentage points, including the ARC Innovation uh, ETF. And so this massive um, underperformance has been driven in part because of fund flows leaving biotech for some less risky asset classes and fixed income. You can see the weekly numbers there on the left. Most weeks this year have been net outflows from the sector. 2023 on the right, the worst net outflows our sector has ever seen, including from the financial crisis since these metrics were calculated. So massive headwinds on the fund flow perspective make you know this, uh, this entire market, the biotech space, really in the state of misery. And I say that as the state of Missouri, which is the show me state. Biotech is in a position where show me the data is what the investment community is asking for. Even during this um, recent treading water phase, we had very positive overall uh, news flow from biotech, 60, 65%, which typically represents a very healthy capital markets uh, backdrop. But unfortunately in this market, it's really been that only fantastic news has really been rewarded by, uh, by the stock markets to date. So very much a stock picker's overall marketplace. That's a great uh, segue to the venture part of the, the ecosystem and cycle around starting companies, venture formation, building and scaling and exiting. Let me talk about the capital underpinning that cycle. Overall venture capital is down significantly from its peak um, eight to 10 quarters ago, but has really stabilized at that five or $6 billion a quarter. This is very much in line with the robust pre-pandemic numbers you know, threefold higher than we were at the beginning of the last decade long bull run. So by all historic measures, still a significant amount of capital being deployed in the venture biotech arena. If we look at the first time financing, so these are brand new companies seeking capital, that number's off at least 60%. We're seeing a real reset um, on pace. It's fair to say that great ideas are still getting uh, supported and funded. Um, what we've seen is tourist investors who were dabbling in venture formation have largely left the space, but that the core venture creation firms are still very active. Atlas is on track to start this year, the same number of companies we started a few years ago during the pandemic. So as these companies um, grow and scale, they need to access 
greater and greater amounts of capital. So if you look at the number of mega rounds that are being done, these are 100 million or more financings. You can actually see that they've stabilized at sort of 15 or 20 per quarter. So still a very large number relative to where we were, you know, just five plus years ago. A lot of big financings are still getting closed there in the center. These are all financings north of 200 million that have been closed um, here year to date. So a lot of big syndicates and significant fundings. One thing to note is that the crossover investments by truly public investors coming back into the private world, you know, during the pandemic bubble, they were running at 50 to 60 per quarter during that period of time. That significantly contracted by 70, 80 percent, um, where very little participation from those top 20 uh, blue chip investors. What might be a green shoot there in the third quarter, we saw 22 financings with participation from this group. So hopefully we'll see more of that. But without crossovers who are public investors helping pull companies into the public markets through the IPO process, the IPO window has largely been closed. And so here's um, the four years running into the, um, uh, the peak of the pandemic at 85 and IPOs in 2021. You know, we've seen about a dozen companies go public each of the last two years. Um, it's been very challenging. It reminds me a lot of the 2010-2011 period when roughly the same number of companies, a dozen per year, got public. They all had to be late stage assets, have inbuilt syndicates ready to uh, fund the entire IPO. That's very much uh, what we're seeing here uh, this year. Here are some of the um, IPOs from their IPO price to, to current. You can see many of them are negative. I think the median is about minus 40% or so, but the real outlier being structure, which is of course participating in that exciting obesity uh, space. The Dearth of IPOs, though, has led to a massive backlog of private companies who've sort of tapped out the private venture capital markets. 130 companies here in the third quarter are essentially um, ready to think about going public if there were an IPO window. To put that into context, that's like three or four years in a normal, healthy IPO uh, market environment. And so this huge backlog of private companies really um, waiting for the window to open back up. But this closed IPO environment is not uh, just about biotech. In a world of higher rates, all risk capital and um, IPO allocations have come down massively. Looking at healthcare and non-healthcare IPOs, you can see they're down 90 plus percent uh, since their peak in 2021. Important to recognize that this isn't just a biotech specific phenomenon. One of the things that uh, having no IPOs has done, though, is open the opportunity to alternatives. And those alternatives are things like reverse mergers. And we may be entering a golden period of time here where a supply of public shells, so these are biotech companies that have failed but have some cash and a public ticker, meets the demand of that backlog of private companies. And so bringing those together, creating paths for companies to go public. You know, these reverse mergers are no longer second class vehicles. We're seeing high quality companies think about going public through these mechanisms. About a dozen already this year and at least a dozen more or so that we know are in the works across the across the ecosystem. Important to note that just doing reverse isn't enough. You need to have the validation of a significant financing, a pipe financing alongside that transaction if you expect to trade well into the aftermarket. The last part of the funding equation, so you're building and scaling privately, you're getting public, is really the follow-on equity market, which is, of course, the largest of the equity markets. Um, if we look at follow-on um, financings, we are seeing a reasonable number of catalyst-driven, event-driven um, financings. We saw $6 billion in the third quarter. We're on track for a $20 billion overall year in this space, you know, with 120 or so, 150 companies raising money in this environment. So really a significant amount of capital in line with 2017, 18, and 19 in the pre-pandemic period. So lots of capital happening around really data-driven events. There's been some mixed, or mixed um, aftermarket performance, but it's worth noting much of this is not being supported by the generalist investment community. Instead, a lot of this is backed by healthcare specialists, many of whom may have an M&A thesis about a bunch of these financings which is a great segue to the public M&A arena. We've seen a lot of bolt-on M&A activity this year, the biggest of which, of course, was Seattle Genetics back in March, but a broad number of other deals. I think the number of billion-dollar-plus acquisitions in the public markets is north of 18 this year. 
to my knowledge, that is actually a historic high in terms of public market biotech um, M&A activity. So nice to see and certainly putting a little bit of a support under the, uh, under the ecosystem, especially for mid and late stage asset companies. Behind this in the private world, a reasonable cadence of M&A this year on track for 15 to 20 plus billion in overall private M&A. The Televant uh, deal most recently being the largest, but nice to see Nimbus and Versanus up there as well. We certainly don't think M&A is going away anytime soon. In fact, we anticipate its cadence to possibly increase here in 2024, especially given the amount of firepower sitting on the sidelines of Big Pharma. Here's some of the top companies. 15 of these all have more than $20 billion of either cash on their balance sheet or available debt. So a massive amount of cash sitting there for bolt-on um, acquisitions and such. So quite a uh, exciting time. Much of these acquisitions then go and get recycled into the public capital markets. And so that's a great um, way of completing the capital part of the um, venture capital cycle. I'm not going to touch on ideas because fundamentally we are awash in great science and great ideas. And uh, I think many of us appreciate that aspect. But I will touch on talent, both um, talent itself and also where talent can work in the ecosystem as those are two important dynamics. First, the talent market today is super dynamic. One out of every four employees in biotech companies are changing jobs. And almost half of those are changing jobs involuntarily. So through rifts, restructurings, and the like, those are being facilitated out of the company, where hopefully they're finding jobs in other emerging biotech companies. But certainly a very fluid and challenging market in the um, northeast around the Boston ecosystem. Those numbers are even slightly higher given the concentration and potential for intercompany uh, movement of, uh, of employees. Fair to say that um, while there's a relatively fluid and, and vibrant market for people moving in and out of biotech companies, the C-suite is incredibly tight. So we still find C-level hires of high quality is, uh, is in an, an incredibly tight and challenging marketplace. If you think about the number of C-level executives that are essentially locked up in some of the public companies that have gone out, the 300, 400 new public companies, that's 1,500 to 2,000 skilled senior executives that we would love to see roll back into the private ecosystem. Now, where do all these folks work? Well, that's where things have gotten better. For many biotechs that are looking for space, space is really no longer a constraint. A great data point of this uh, is that there were 20 annually about 20 leases in the Boston market each year. There's over 140 subleases available right now in the Boston system. So up 700%, really a massive increase in overall uh, space that's available for biotech companies. I feel for the biotechs that may have signed on to large leases at higher prices. Prices are coming down by 20, 30%. Um, over the last year. Certainly being a new tenant looking for space, it's a great time to do that. Another data point, the San Francisco market went from close to zero vacancy rates to over 15% vacancy rates as of the last uh, data cut. So space no longer a real challenge um, and certainly an abundant supply out there to be able to put young biotech companies um, into business. And so that's a wrap of the venture cycle itself, but what are the implications for venture capital performance? So I'm going to take the two ends of the venture distribution. First, let's look at the sort of high end, the, the winners, the 10x winners over time. These are realized exits each year over this period. The long-term historic average is around 3% in biotech for a 10x or more um, realized win. You can see that during the pandemic in 2021, that number almost doubled to 7%. So way above the industry average. And what we're seeing is, of course, mean reversion. The inverse of that is happening on the bottom end. So these are deals that uh, you lose money on. 35 or 40 percent has been the historic uh, long-term average for um, loss ratios in the, in the biotech space. You can see that dropped as low as 20 percent at the peak of the pandemic bubble and has, of course, sprung up here in uh, the recent period. And so I see this as more normalization of the venture capital distribution and mean reversion than anything else. How does venture compare to the public markets? Um, if you take a look at public market equivalent returns, so the cash that goes in and out of venture funds, and compare that to cash in and out in the same way with both the XBI index or the Russell 2000, 
both in the one year through last March, as well as the five year, venture capital has outperformed, not only at the all fund level, so the median, but also, of course, at the top quartile side of things. Now, those one year numbers, the absolute numbers are negative, but they're much more negative in the public equity indices. So overall, real outperformance, which I think is, uh, is excellent. If we step back then and ask, you know, here was the 20, 2003 report, where are we? What happened last time we went through this period? First, the IPO markets were really bad for the rest of the decade. The 2000s, the noughts, were an incredibly challenging time for biotech IPOs. Great review here. Um, you should go and uh, check out. Then uh, many VC firms during this challenging period actually disappeared. This was a list in that 2003 um, report of some of the largest uh, major venture capital funds that were raised in the life sciences. All but two of these are gone. And then lastly, LPs largely left the sector. It took 15 years for LP commitments back to venture capital to reach their former highs. And so LPs pulled back. It was a real challenge um, in the noughts for biotech venture capital. It's fair to say we don't think this is going to happen this time. And certainly we think this time is different than that. And, and we remain hopeful for a bunch of reasons. First, much deeper equity capital market participation, both on the private side and public. About $10 billion of Venture IPO and follow-on funding happened in uh, 2002, 2003. Today, that number, even without a robust IPO environment, is 40 or 50 billion. Um, so significantly increased overall participation. Secondly, there's lots of successful uh, mid-cap and large-cap biotechs now, which create opportunities to bring generalists into the space and have them hold real positions in large companies. Back in 2003, there was less than $20 billion biotechs. Today, there's over 85 coming down from a peak of about 125 just a couple years ago. So a lot of large names in that mid and emerging biotech space. Third, we all appreciate the scientific breakthroughs with massive potential is as deep and rich as ever. Fourth, industry structure fundamentally favoring the ecosystem of external innovation, biotech origination, partnering with pharma and vice versa. So that industry structure is very different than where we were 20 years ago. And then lastly, within the asset class itself, frankly, there are fewer tourist LPs to this asset class than perhaps at the early part of the last of the 2000s. Institutional LPs today, generally taking a long-term view across cycles, looking at top tier funds and, and maintaining a, a much longer term innovation centric view of the world. And so for all of those reasons, we remain um, certainly quite bullish about where things are in terms of the venture capital ecosystem. That's actually a great segue to what's been going on at Atlas Venture. Let's take a snapshot from um, 2002 and 2004 period of time led by uh, JF and Peter here looking um, just a little bit younger than they do today, but uh, fearless leaders and great mentors. Um, Three great companies were started in this challenging period of time. Alnylam in 2002, Momenta in 2003, and Horizon, one of the two um, daughter or two companies that merged was Nitec in the Atlas portfolio. Um, you take 20 years later, about $50 billion of value from these three and over 20 approved drugs. Um, so really significant value creation. What's the old phrase of, you know, tough vines make great wines. That's certainly true in this period of time. Lots of great companies were formed then, and I suspect folks will look back to today with the same uh, perspective. Lots of the DNA of our strategy was encoded around this time that we've honed and, and strengthened over the last couple decades. These are really the key pillars of the strategy. Seed-led venture creation, roll our sleeves up, find great science around the world, and build companies locally in our offices with us, a pure play focus on therapeutics um, and high impact therapeutics, underpinning our thesis of doing well by doing good. All of this rolls into our business models. We have a fairly diverse spectrum of business models despite a concentration in therapeutics from big platform companies all the way to single asset entities. And you can see they differ in terms of their capital intensity, the degree of virtual R&D versus in-house, their capital markets correlation, the need to access the public equity markets. But fundamentally, you can drive great returns up and down this spectrum, and we've had a long history of doing that. How does this all get deployed in that science-first uh, strategy? 
Well, if we take a look at our pipeline and what type of disease areas we've been investing in, over 160 active programs here today, a nice comparison to where we were in 2017. Oncology remains a significant part of what we do, but what's interesting is under the surface there, you see a lot of ADC, a lot of radio pharma, and some more novel areas in oncology. You'll also note that immunology is up, you know, 2.5x or so since that period of time. A number of autoimmune disease programs, for instance. If we look at our modality mix, again, slight changes here, slightly more biologics, including some of the, uh, the ADCs as mentioned. But importantly, small molecules remain, despite the IRA, small molecules remain a really important part of our overall scientific and modality mix. What's interesting about that 45% is a lot of those small molecules are really next-gen approaches, whether that's Protax, Glues, Covalency, Alistair, a number of more innovative uh, approaches to what we would call smart chemistry. Rolling this into a mid-sized pharma pipeline, so to speak, you can see the change from 2017 to 2023, a lot of progression into early development in particular. We now have over 45 phase one and two um, programs. Lots of uh, data cards are getting turned, which is certainly an exciting overall time. But of course, we don't advance all of this pipeline ourselves. Our partnerships with pharma are super important. This year, we had a number of partnerships there in the gene therapy space, in the um, genetic medicine arena. We also had precision medicine there with Scorpion and a really interesting IRF5 program there with Abby in the immunology space. And so partnering is important, but so is, of course, the other form of capital we bring into our companies, which is the equity capital side. A lot of seed and series A companies have raised in the last year or so across the top a number of these really significant financings for young companies. And then in the series B and beyond later stage private companies, a lot of capital has flown in uh, to help them really advance into the clinic and beyond. We haven't had any um, IPOs this year, but we have had uh, three reverse mergers close, Disc and Gemini, Dianthus into Magenta, and Coro into Frequency. They've gotten significant amounts of cash associated with those pipe transactions and are all poised um, to succeed as they develop their assets deeper into the clinic. And we know a number of other ongoing processes um, as well right now. Though we haven't had uh, big public exits per se, we have had uh, two um, very large and, and significant M&A events this year. The Nimbus Takeda transaction, probably the single largest absolute return for Atlas Venture in our history. And Versanus in the obesity space, you know, a uh, relatively short duration, but super exciting uh, company for us in the portfolio. What does all this mean for returns? Here's a, uh, again, a public market equivalent return. So how have we done incremental or beyond the biotech index and the S&P? So significantly outperforming in Fund 10 and Fund 11, both of which are in um, harvest mode, so to speak. These are older funds where the companies in them were, were starting to exit those positions. Our more recent funds, Fund 12 and 13, are still on the J curve, and we look forward to sharing those profiles with you as those uh, portfolios emerge. What's the brains behind all of this? Well, we, I'm very fortunate to work with a fantastic team. There's the partners and uh, the broader investment team, really a fantastic group of individuals with a broad range of skills and capabilities. Of course, the real brains behind the operation is uh, you know, all of the broader operations team that we have, led by our stellar CFO, Omar Chohan. So with that, I'll wrap up. You know, we're continuing to focus on the venture capital cycle. We have um, abundant dry powder across uh, Fund 13 and our second opportunity fund to support our 50 existing portfolio companies. We anticipate starting six to eight new companies each year, pursuing exit and liquidity optionality in all of our companies. And you know, fundamentally, despite the headwinds that the sector faces, we remain very optimistic about biotech's long-term future here. And so with that, thank you very much for joining me for the Atlas Year in Review.